Well, build my gallows and build them high Makes a long time climbing before I die I want the chance Hi, this is Matty and just uh, because I forgot to mention this in the podcast when we recorded it and I said I would uh, this is a wee reminder that there is the David Gray testimonial dinner uh, later this year, Saturday the 9th of September um, at the Edinburgh International Conference Centre it's nearly sold out, there are a few tables left uh, so if you go to our Twitter You'll see a post from today, which is Sunday, uh, with a link to where you can pick up tickets for it. Obviously, it'd be great to honour a proper legend. Uh, so go check out if you fancy going. Enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Long Bangers. I'm Matty. Hello, oh, I'm Colin. And we're well, you can introduce yourself, Anna. So I was going to introduce the Ennis Burns, Hibs fan and, uh, from the Untribal Politics uh, podcast. Ennis, how are you doing? Yeah, no, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, eh? I'm a bit excited about coming on, eh? So. <laughs> You're only human, eh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. How are you both doing, Ennis? How are you doing, anyway? You all right? Not bad. Uh, frustrating week. Um, I watched the game on Thursday, and it was, uh, I, as I said off camera, I was a bit numb to it. I'm a bit numb to when we get these bad results, because there's been that many of them recently. Um, but it was just, I, I just felt like they were, they, they half arsed it, and... It, it, it slightly ruined my week. I've had a good week otherwise, but yes, a, sl- a slight blip in the middle of the week, of course. But uh, we'll come on to that. And uh, Colin, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm just uh, no long up. I, I nearly, nearly missed the deadline. And the camera issues were nothing to do with that. It was no. uh, purely, purely um, to due to my, my hangover yesterday. So I, I'm, I'm all right. Uh, why, why are you hangover? What were you up to? So I, I, are we going to talk about the Blackpool game? On this, no, uh, very little. Like neither of us went, and it was uh, like a fucking good, like a, a kids game, wasn't it? Really, so good because I, I know nothing about it. I, I didn't even know the result. I remember, I had to put in the uh, put in the chat well after the game finished to see what the score was because nobody mentioned it. So I assume we'd got beat, right? Because there was nothing yeah. happening. Um, because it was out all day. I, I got a gentleman's afternoon tea um, for a Father's Day present. Um, so it's been like a year and a half in the making, but eventually got there and. Uh, and enjoyed that, but obviously, the, as I was saying, the, the the food, which was really good, the sausage rolls and, and all that stuff that you get was nice, but it's all the beer that goes with it, and then the wine, and then I even had one of the Apple, Apple Ariel spritzers as well, you know, one of these things, oh, yeah. try one of them, I thought it was just a wee nightcap, you know, that's obviously, nice. that's that, what I'm blaming for the way I'm feeling at the moment. At a gentleman's <laughs> afternoon tea, do you have to uh, drink your pipe with your pinky no, there, etc., <laughs> sniff it first? That. No, no, no. That's uh, it. Was you know what? The, I didn't go for any of the uh, any of the sniffy beers. Um, I, I went for it was Czech Czech lagers. I took um, as my my choice of uh, flights. But you could have done the there was the fruity fruity option, which I assume is the one that you make sniff before you drink. Aye. Um, Blue Moon and all of that stuff. So no, I didn't didn't choose it, but yeah, I did have my pink out anyway, just Good. because. Good. Why wouldn't you? Well, I never, uh, I never, never followed too much of the game yesterday. I went to see Oppenheimer, which I think was probably more cheerful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a cracking movie, but we went to the IMAX in uh, in Dunfermline, and uh, fuck, uh, what a film! We would thoroughly recommend it. Like, it's uh, superb. Not many laughs, I would say that. Right, so um, I feel like I should add something about my wee bam. I'm bored as any where the football here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just waiting for, I'm just waiting for the season to kick off, man, honestly. I know it's no far away now, like a, a week a week to go. So I think um Colin, we'll we'll do uh, an extra time. We'll we'll talk about our predictions for the season because it's kind of the last opportunity for us to uh, to do that because we're hoping to have another guest on for long bangers next week. Um and as you've joined us obviously for a uh, for a reason, you know, just here for the uh, the fun of it. You're uh, getting involved with the White Ribbon campaign. Do you want to tell us a bit about it? Yes, absolutely. So, first of all, thanks for having us on. Uh, the reason I'm not just here to rant about the Hibs, I'm here to talk about a charity I've been supporting. Basically, I've been doing work in recent weeks. They're called White Ribbon Scotland. And the reason it's sort of specifically important to football is that I've actually wrote to both Hibs and Hearts uh, to join both Edinburgh clubs to be industry leading in supporting this charity. So, the charity uh, basically asked men to make a pledge never to commit, condone, or stay silent about violence against women. Uh, They basically approach organisations, schools, colleges, communities in general, and provide information and training on how we can do so, because 
small changes to our behaviour and use language can make a massive difference to the safety of women right across Scotland. Um, and the reason I had the idea of approaching football clubs is because there's been a lot of stuff about inclusivity at football clubs in the last year. There was a lot of LGBTQ plus stuff at uh, Easter Road, for mm-hmm. example, which I thought was brilliant. And it's basically trying to foster an environment where you tell people, no matter who you are, you can come at the football safely and uh, treated as equally and enjoy the thing that we all love, uh, which is football. And, you know, I don't need to tell your listeners that, you know, how important it is to walk up to the game on a Saturday afternoon and get lost in the emotion that is football from, from your work, your nine till five during the week, your anxieties, your your troubles at home, whatever you've got on during the week. You know, the football's so important to people. Now, I'm not saying watching Hibs is any good for your anxiety. Don't get me wrong. But if people like to get lost in some sort of emotion that they're not feeling during the week. However, what comes with that sometimes is a feeling of thinking I can say or do what I want at the football because I'm not in an environment of my nine till five. Now, I remember a few years ago when Hibs were at Hamden and I called out a guy behind me that shouted a racist comment on the pitch. I think he was shouting at Stevenson going in for a tackle with a black player and telling him to show his white supremacy or his or his white power as he was going into the tackle. Fucking hell. And I turned around to him and I was like, did, did I just hear you actually shout that? And immediately the guy flustered. He, he was apologising. He was like, oh, I'm sorry, mate. You know, I just get a wee bit excited and I say things that I don't mean at the football. And, you know, I, obviously I told him to wind his neck in first and foremost, but I remember his, his response actually stuck with me a little bit, and I'll tell you why. Um, I actually believed him. Like, see, when he was flustering and apologising and saying that he didn't mean it, I believed him. And I think he he, he talked about the wrong emotion. He said he, get, he got a wee bit too excited at the football. I think there was a bit of misplaced anger there from somewhere. Something's bothering him in his week, and he's using the football as a vehicle to vent that anger in a way that's controversial and really lets it out in a different environment, but it was misplaced um, nonetheless. So I don't know if you've heard of a guy called Graham Golden who works at Police Scotland and he started a campaign called Don't Be That Guy, mm-hmm. which basically asks men to reflect a little bit on the language that they're using about women, some of the jokes that they're making, and just being a little bit about more cautious about what they say. And you know, a lot of people, that might strike a nerve and they might say, oh, look, I'm just having a laugh. I'm not really telling you that you're wrong. You you might be having a laugh. What I'm telling you is the more that we use that kind of language, the more it legitimizes and normalizes it for people that would take it too far. So when they go to take that action, somewhere in their psychological subconscious, it's given them a green flag instead of a red flag when they go to act and commit violence against women. And um, he also talks about the need for, for active bystanders. So when someone's sort of sneering at women, maybe intimidating them, staring at them, making sexual comments even. He encourages men to to intervene in those situations because we need to be doing more about these situations so it's not normalised whatsoever. Now, a lot of people might say, well, I'm not getting involved, that's not my problem. Um, <laughs> with respect, I'm, I'm, t- I'm out here telling people that it is your problem. Now, you guys are probably, you might have daughters, sisters, mothers that are very close to you. I'm going to tell you a statistic which struck me as the most and encouraged me most to get involved because I've got a little sister and I've got a mum that I care about a lot. If we were to take sexual harassment, for example, 97% of 18 to 24-year-olds have experienced sexual harassment by a member of the public in the UK. 97%. So mm. when when you think about that daughter, that sister, that that female friend that you're close to, your girlfriend, when I was talking there just a second ago, the overwhelming evidence suggests that they've experienced sexual harassment by a member of the public. I, I just think I, I just think that's mental, and that's what's kind of spurred me on to act and support this charity. Because if women themselves could have dealt with the problem, it would have been dealt with already. We need men to get involved, and that's what White Ribbon are trying to intervene and do, and encourage men to make that pledge, never to commit, condone or stay silent about violence against women. And the reason I had the inspiration to target football clubs is because, yes, you know, women go to the football as well, but these are hubs of men that gather and go to the football, so we need to target these communities and just make small adjustments to our behaviour and use language, and that ripple effect of respect will eventually lead to someone somewhere, you know, getting saved or feeling more safe in Scotland. So 
just by taking ownership and just starting with that pledge, you go into whiteribbonscotland.org, it takes 30 seconds, and make that pledge with them. Just forcing that interaction will force someone somewhere to think differently in a situation. Now, I'm not out here to kind of shame people or make you feel guilty. Like, everyone said things that they regret. You know, I'm included in that. Everyone said things that they don't mean. But I, I just think if we take these actions into account, that we just become better people more generally. If you entrench that level of respect in people and start acting, you're more likely to be more respectful to minority groups, for example. And, you know, maybe that Hamden, that guy at Hamden, maybe he would have thought differently if he'd made a pledge with right women and had that entrenched level of respect for women at an early point in his life. Maybe he would have thought twice. Or, and I even take myself, for example, and I, I sort of reflect on situations where there's maybe been a loved one or a friend that's made a joke that's maybe a wee bit too far. And I should have acted on that and said, maybe even a day later, just said, that was a wee bit out of order. Just maybe don't, that's not our part. Do you know what I mean? Maybe cut that out in future. And the reason I think the symbol is so important is because I don't, I think you've seen this, Matty, on social media, but I've seen, I wore this white ribbon to the Hib Celtic game a few months ago when we beat them 4 2. And I was meeting four of my mates at the pub. And one of the first, conversations we had was well, what's that badge on your on your jacket and I explained what the charity was a little bit of the work I was doing and what was interesting is every single one of those men nodded agreed and then had a positive contribution to that conversation afterwards and see forcing that interaction that will stick in their mind somewhere and, and even if it's one of those four men in future when they go to say something that's a wee bit wee bit over the line they will think twice about it and that having that ripple effect of respect will make all those sisters, daughters, all those close females that you were thinking about just there a lot safer in Scotland. So I just I'd encourage people today, you know, if you're if you're hanging for Blackpool yesterday and you want to be a better person this week, you've got the anxiety. I've got something that'll make you instantly a better person. Go into whiteribbonscotland.org.uk and pledge never to commit, condone or stay silent about violence against women. And uh, the reason um, I'm putting it towards football is that I've written to Hibs and Hearts uh, I was up at Tyne Castle on Friday uh, with a meeting with the Community Foundations Director. I've contacted Hibs as well with the help of a politician and hopefully we're going to have an awareness raising match and hopefully with your support and uh, getting the you know getting the talk around the fan base, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll do something really powerful. Yeah, I hope so. I think it's like a it's a really important cause and it's not like us to be sort of serious about stuff for uh, for very long but like you said, I mean, I've got two sisters I've got uh, obviously my mum, wife two daughters um, and, and you know what the experience like it's not it's not an anomaly for somebody to say something out of order to, uh, to them or to act in a certain way you see it in the workplace you know you, you see all these things and people do need to speak up and even like this podcast for example we had a, a weak work case stat that came through to say like we had a slightly above average percentage of female listeners right, which blew my mind because right, you, you sort of your stereotypical view is that this mostly goes out to guys and, and you know, the majority of our listeners are guys, but in terms of having a a, a percentage of uh, female representation in, in our listeners, we, we do quite well for it. So I, I know we have that audience as well that are affected by it. So I think it's really a good thing to get involved with this. I think you should be proud of yourself for um, you. for, for getting involved and taking it to the, the clubs. I hope pubs get involved as well as uh, as well as hearts and uh, but what are your thoughts on it? No, it's good. It's funny, I was just reading the paper earlier on, <clears throat> um, and they're doing something in London as well. It's the can that that's mate or something. It's like mate with about five A's in it. It's like, and, and that's the that's the, uh, the mate, tagline. Isn't it? Yeah, stuff. Uh, can, you kind of say that sort of thing, you know, like that. That similar. Similar thing. Um, yeah. So they're trying to evolve. So the don't be that guy one that I mentioned was obviously a big yeah. one. Um, they're trying to evolve with it. Um, you know, that made a bit big impact in the first year, but they're trying to come up with different little slogans and just to keep the conversation going because it's difficult to keep it up. Um, but I just thought, you know, if we can get Hibs and Hearts to become industry leading and certainly within the realms of football clubs and doing so, and that'd be brilliant for the image of Edinburgh football because I think that, you know, as fierce as the Hibs Hearts rivalry is, when there's bigger issues at play, the two clubs do tend to come together. You've seen that with Block 7 last season with the young laddie for Hearts that died. I think he was 15 years old. They had the Forever 15 banner, for example. The two clubs do come together at, at these times. And, you know, regardless of all the horrible things we, we call each other on Derby Day, do you know what I mean? When there's bigger issues at play, 
I think that's really important. And that's why I approached both clubs, uh, not just Hibs, because I think that would be a stronger message if we if we all came together and, and supported that cause. Aye, definitely. Um, now, now the two teams are they're making a bigger, a bigger thing about the women team being integrated as well, um, yep. you know, which comes to the community side, but I know they're integrating into the full football club, so I think it would be something that the clubs will be wanting to do more of. So, nah, it's good, really good. Yeah. Nah, uh, so, pre- so, so uh, I was just saying, I appreciate you guys don't talk about these uh, kind of issues in light, and I appreciate you giving me the time on the on the podcast to talk about. It. I know it's Hub's podcast, but thank you very much, honestly. Uh, you're right, you're right. It's important. It's, it's funny because you, you, it's something that we, I think we practice anyway, Colin. Um, we've got like a, we're in a few WhatsApp groups, and you'd be surprised at the reaction when you say something like somebody posts something. And so occasionally, people post things and maybe haven't thought about it or whatever. Posted fairly innocently, um, and you know there's no real intent behind it, but th- th- there is something there that's no right, and we've we've both been on and, and sort of called it out, and the reaction you get is overwhelmingly positive because I think everybody else in the group feels uncomfortable with what's been posted, and it only takes like a wee that's not really appropriate here, and it changes it, and that that's all it takes. Like a, a nobody needs to feel awkward about it, nobody needs to, to kind of go on feeling bad and feeling chastised by it. It's just like a conversation to say, that's just no us, is it? Like, let's do better. Exactly. I, I, listen, I, as I said before, the, the the intent of the campaign is to go out and shame men and make them feel guilty about whether, you know, we're in a different place to where we were about 50, 15, 20 years ago, for example. Like, we love, we'll have all made misogynist jokes that we didn't even know at the time was misogynist. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You, had the, you had the Hearts fans singing all oh, the high bees are gay 15 years ago, which is yeah, I, hard to believe that that was even in the same world that we're living in. Do you know what I mean? So it's not, it's not about shaming people. It's not about pointing the finger and saying, you're a bad guy. It's about saying from here forward, just make that step, make that simple step, and you'll have contributed to a massive wave of, of, of a change in attitudes towards women to, to make them just feel safer. Yeah, no, it's good because I mean even even I no no I'm not that I've well, got to get to the hibs bit, but the, you've got the, the stuff in the paper last week about the, the sort of inherent sort of sexism in McDonald's and then you had you've got the fucking taste and um, brainwashing teenagers. Aye. Uh, teenage boys and it's I think it, there's no great in schools like you know the wee laddies listening to these fucking idiots. Um, so, so it's it's be good to get to that level, uh, to that age group, because they're the ones that are going to cause bother for for people in the next few years. I've got three three daughters, uh, teen, well, two teenagers, and one a bit older than that. Um, and you know, in schools, there's some uh, wee fucking idiots to be quite right. honest, based on following these idiots on Twitter and being right. influenced. Right, well, talking about shame and needing to do better, let's move on to Hibs. <laughs> a, 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 <laughs> so natural, a natural <laughs> next step. <laughs> I think it's an easy segue, that one, isn't it? Um, right, so, as, as we said at the start, right, we played Blackpool yesterday, but because it was more or less a B team that went down, there was no coverage of it, uh, I think we can acknowledge the result. There's a couple of questions coming from listeners that we'll, we'll answer, but we'll not spend too much time talking about it. I think the bigger focus for today will be uh, Thursday's defeat uh, through an Andorra, uh, where we lost two one. Uh, Colin, thoughts on on that game? I, I did watch it. Um, I didn't go. I was watching it on BBC. It was really, really bad. It was like it was like a really poor pre season game for us, right? Which mm-hmm. was always my worry. Like anyway, like I said, I don't know where the Andorra and the guys. I don't know if they've started their season. Probably not, but I don't know. Because normally my worry is we catch a team that are mid-season, and then that happens because we're not ready. Now, why we're not ready, I don't know. Because we knew this was happening. Because I was worried about it in May when I see the draw I finish sixth and fifth for reasons like get humiliated like that. So we should have been ready for it because we wanted it, we needed it, and, and we were all desperate for it, and we weren't ready for it, and it was fucking appalling. Hi, Ennis, what about you? Yeah, I think. I mean, Hibs fans are a were a paranoid group of people. Um, I I think the, there was a big reaction at the end there, especially the boys and, and and girls that went over. And I can understand that. I think we will get better. Uh, as I said to you on on uh, off records, Matty, before this, it reminded me. I went to the Spartans Dundee United game a few weeks ago, where Spartans turned them over, and Dundee United's were you know they were making heavy weather. 
you know, they were passing passing the ball and not really didn't really have any urgency. And it reminded me of that. It just it didn't it had a preseason feel to it. It didn't have the feel of a European qualifier. And it when Marshall got the ball and you had defenders jogging out, not even looking for him, we're needing a goal here. Um, so I think we will get better. I think it was it's definitely a kick up the backside for Lee Johnson and his boys. Um, and I can understand the, the anger afterwards because it's probably one of the worst results in our history, to be honest with you. I, th- I thought the tone was set wrong for uh, Lee Johnson for the start. There were like a couple of things about it. So I think he didn't, I think he treated it like a preseason game with, you know, kind of getting legs, uh, minutes and legs and that, that kind of chat. But also, and folk might disagree with this, right? but I think the idea of putting Martin Boyle on the bench with no intention of playing him as a cheerleader. I think that was the phrase that he used. Did he say that? I'm sure. Because I actually thought, right, I'll tell you, sorry, I'm butting in on your maybe bit, but I thought he was on the bench and if we were 3-0 up like we were talking ourselves into, they might have brought him on for to get 15 minutes in him there and then. So he was never, ever coming on. I know. He said said in advance that he wasn't going to play. He was a bit of a cheerleader. I'll try and find the the, the quote to to share it. I hope I'm not going to put that He's good at that. That's what I'll show you. That's what Australia had him for as well, so maybe he's just a sort of but, niche thing he's got. But put somebody on the bench that can make a difference to the game. So if you're mm-hmm. chasing it, you're not going, oh, fuck, I, I wish I could have turned to this player, but I've got Martin Bowen, he's not ready yet. Do you know, like, mm-hmm. I just think that if if you're a player and you're going, all right, this one's going to be easy, lads, but we're, we're fucking not even bothered but who's on the bench. That sounds I, shite, though, eh? Because what we're saying is he's on the bench and never going to play, but two days later he's starting. Aye. So he must have been nearly ready. Aye. That's, that's just another one he has. That's just another one he has once when he ties his silicon well, knots when he's talking. The, the other thing he said was uh, Levitt wasn't ready either. He said Levitt had struggled in the heat and the uh, uh, and uh, he, uh, he had missed the preseason. He'd had concussion at Dundee United. He was weeks behind when uh, when we signed him, uh, and he thought the so he he explained why he played him was that uh, we would have that extra man in midfield against their four, and, and Levitt would be able to uh, knock it about. But he also said he wasn't ready to play, and that's why he took him off at half time. And you just think, well, if you're playing a player that's no ready to play, uh, and again, how seriously are you taking this game? See, the interview I heard them saying that it wasn't that he wasn't ready. It was that, and it, it might have been a different interview, but it was that he struggled at altitude or uh, in the heat, sorry, in Spain, and what last couple of weeks ago, and he struggled again here. So he was almost suggesting he struggles in the heat rather than he wasn't ready or wasn't he fit. That's what I took from the interview I heard ah, them say. So you so see so that it wasn't you- that. He also went on to say, and he went he clearly said he had the MCL injury, right? Which I think was that a medial cruciate uh, yeah, or something that's like that. Like, right? right? M- MCL, um, and he played something like 19 minutes and 70 minutes at Dundee United before the end of the season. Uh, he then came back to pre season, got concussed, missed three yeah. weeks of that. Uh, so they got him, and he was, he was way behind the rest of the group. So, in terms of his fitness, he wasn't, he wasn't ready, so had quite a long way to go. So that, that um, I, I mean, we're talking about two different cases there. To be fair, Martin, Martin Boyle was out for a very long time, and mm-hmm. we're obviously managing it. However, mm-hmm. I was a bit like you, Colin, and I don't know if it was a different interview, but I interpreted it. He certainly said the words, "I'm going to resist the temptation to bring on Boyle," which gave me the impression of if we're in a doomsday scenario, we will bring him on, and if we need him for twenty minutes, I don't, I don't know what constitutes a doomsday scenario being two 0 down to an Andorran team. <laughs> but, that must be it. But the, but but that actually I didn't know that about Levitt, and that actually fills me with a bit of confidence because my biggest worry this year was midfield again, and I thought if Levitt wasn't ready at the start of the season, I thought we've got another, you know, we've got another group of individually decent players that aren't they working that well as a midfield, and when you're playing four three three with three midfielders, they all know they all need to be on point. I think another worry as well was Josh Campbell. I get slagged for criticizing him quite a lot, but I think he goes out of games quite a lot. I think he goes missing, he loses the ball sometimes, and for, for all the attacking sort of returns that he gives the team, if you're playing three midfields, you need all those three midfielders working hard and winning the ball back and grinding out games. I like get such an important part of the uh, part of the park. Obviously Joe Newell came on and got pass marks, but that was my that was my worry going into the season. But I think that fills me with confidence more than anything that Levitt wasn't ready, um certainly going into that game. Aye. Um, what we'll do is we'll because we'll, we can pick the bones at the uh, the game right. But in, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll go to our questions to the listeners because I think by the time we've got through them, we'll we'll cover more or less everything. There's a few that are a wee bit off topic as we start off, right? But 
Um, we'll go through them right. First one, Tom Wallace. Uh, why did Hibbs move Dubrovsky on? Uh, okay, his distribution wasn't good, but you've proved Marshall's isn't great either. Um, Colin Marshall chucked one in really uh, on Thursday. Again, fair to say, his distribution hasn't been as great as it was when he first joined. Should we have kept Dubrovsky? No. I don't, I don't, I don't, think, I don't think Dubrovsky's at the level. He had a very good derby at Easter Road, granted, but I don't think he's, I don't think he's quite there. I don't think he's quite at the standard that we we need him to be. He might be in a few years' time, but he's just not there. But we signed, we've signed two keepers. Mm-hmm. Why are we still playing David Marshall? He's finished. He's obviously too old. He can't get to the ball anymore. He's finished as a keeper. Why? We've got a keeper on the bench. We've literally just signed. Why aren't we playing them? I, I, I don't understand that one. I did not understand that at all. He can't be our number one going forward. Oh, I think they've been. I think so. Coming to the Broski, I think they wait in. I think that they respect for Marshall almost. They were waiting on him making another mistake. They maybe just didn't think it would happen that quickly. So they signed the boy because we spoke about this already when we signed I him. One of the summer ones that he'll be your number one. But it's almost like he's not coming in as number one because then it's because he's taking the captaincy off him already before that mistake, and that was almost like the easing it in that you're not going to be number one by the end of the season. We're just waiting and you making a mistake, and it's just like he's just went and done it right away and go over and done with. Did um, I get me started? Did me get me started on the captaincy? By the way, why why was our new captain not in the front line facing the media after that result instead of throwing Joe Newell to the wolves? I, I, been, I, I, I think it really matters. I, I, I think the captaincy is totally overplayed. I do. Um, I, I think. And, and to be honest, I tell you what though, like there's folk like that. That, that would have, if Hanlon had come out and said the exact same words Neil said, that would have been complaining at what Hanlon was saying because it was Hanlon that was saying it. That's what I think. Um, but, and that's what would have happened. So maybe, Joe Neil, your player of the year, folk, folks start liking you now, even though it was only a few months ago that there's there's a, a, a quite a noisy minority who wanted, didn't want him playing. So, uh, like, because we sit here every week and we get like various stuff coming in and you go, oh, Joe Neil's turn this week or month. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I Hanlon's you... always there, and the, always somebody's always sitting waiting to hammer Hanlon, like no matter what. So I just I, I agree with that. To be fair, and, and to be fair, I've been I've been guilty of that at times as well. I think it's just because he's been there that long that people it's a, it's an easy scapegoat him and Stevenson, yes. obviously. However, I think I think the captaincy role is is understated. I think it's a very important role in the team. You you need someone, and I think Joe Newell, to be fair to him, has been consistent in this throughout his year, even if uh, he's had bad spells. He always digs in on a derby. He always digs deep, even when we're playing badly. And he sh- he shows leadership by performance. I don't mm. see that. I don't see that from Hanlon in the big games. Maybe very few times. But I think in one of the, your worst results in history, you've not got the captain going out there and facing the media and taking responsibility. I think that sets a really bad precedent for the season going forward. Maybe you know, I you see that. You know, there's other thing. Maybe, maybe you, you put his hand up for it. Again, he also... Scored the goal and changed the game, and uh, I, 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 I mean, know he's got to get the, the fans are on like he's the only one getting past Mark. He's, uh, he's scored the goal. It's almost like a PR, a PR move to some. Uh, but I, I see, I see the point you're making. Back to Dabrowski, like to spend that time and money developing him to actually at the point when he's going to break into the first team, release him seems a bit strange. But then there was all the change of management that, uh, that's probably done for him. He's done alright at eighth. I mean, he scored, uh, saved a couple of penalties against uh, Kelly, but I think that also clouds things. Yeah, like keepers in a penalty shootout. You saw it with um, Xander Clark going to the Scotland uh, team because he had a couple of uh, penalty saves. Right? Yeah. He's a decent keeper, right? But he got like a, a couple of good games and high profile games, and a couple of penalty saves, and then drafted in the Scotland squad because everybody thought he was fucking brilliant. And he's he's good, but he's not an international level keeper. And I think Dubrovsky gets kind of quoted for that now because he's just saved a couple of penalties against uh, Kelly through the mm. uh, through the week. All uh, right, next uh, next question comes from famous Edinburgh Highbies, who says uh, the possible signing of Dylan Vente is a bad one, overpriced for a player that's not progressed near as much as people thought he would. I think fans are being blinded by the price tag, and with his goals in the Netherlands second division, I'll keep saying Josh O'Connor is the answer. So is this a uh, is this the first instance of a player being written off before they've signed? <laughs> no, 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 that happens every time he signs them. Well, I suppose. I Just think we've got a price tag to hang on with them. You know what? I, I I think if you're taking negatives from that, you're going to take neg- negatives from everything. You know, finally, we've got a manager that's been backed properly. And a proper, but you, you forget about Melkerson and McCurdy that have cost you about 700 grand Aye. as well, by the way. Joanne. 
uh, Johan as well. We spent a well, lot of money, so the manager's been backed. Look, look, the guy's I ah, scored goals in the second division, but he still scored goals. I look back to our, our last striker that was at our most one of our most successful strikers, Kevin Nisbet. We picked him up from a championship side. You know, it's a bit like it's a bit like Celtic loaning out a player to them fair with him and, and bagging the goals in for two seasons and picking him up. I don't guess that. I, like on, in terms of his record, I don't see how you can see a negative. The boy at Aberdeen pick up last season that Duke. Did he not come for a B team? And Benfica, yeah, exactly. And if, if he was back in the goals of the Premier Division, but with all due respect, he would he be coming to the Hibs? <laughs> you know I, mean? I don't know the guy, I've never heard them until that headline came out at the start. Or no, it was in the morning, wasn't it? We yeah. got in the message. Um, never heard them, still never heard them. No, watched any YouTube videos because I don't put any, um, that's just a sales pitch. Eh? So I, I've not got any. I'll wait and see if we sign them. I'll, I'll judge them when I've watched, when I've watched them a few times. Well, I have. I've uh, quite openly fallen into the trap of getting excited about it because oh, I did watch did watch his YouTube video. Of course you did. Uh, I do like the fact that we're spending a bit of money on him. Um, with regards to Josh O'Connor, I think Josh O'Connor might be the answer long term. Uh, we'll see how he gets on this season at Airdrie. I think it's an scored the winner yesterday. He did. Yeah, uh, I put Bonner Bonner Goose. I think it's a penalty. Like, but it was, so, uh, yeah. so you want to see him do well, and I think that's the benefit of having players coming through the ranks and being able to loan them out and see how they get on. That eventually, obviously, the plan is for them to come and take over. Um, Gaza said, uh, "Should Yuan play through the middle? Seem to play better last season through the middle." Yes, I, I can see that. You, you know what I was going to say earlier on? Um, we were talking about, um, I don't know, somebody messaged something in that prompted the four three three mention. Now we didn't really get any information in that one here. However, I've heard Johnson say after possibly the friendly last week. We've not really got enough in the wide areas. Mm-hmm. Why are we persist in playing a formation that requires wide players in? Why not change the formation to something more suitable to what we've got Aye. and play two through the middle or one up and five in the middle or something? Why, why, are, we, why are we persisting with playing players out of position like Melkerson the other night or um, the Yuan looked better through the middle at times the games he played last season as well I, I quite like him out wide but he, he, I thought the other night he was greedy as fuck and it was like he almost thought this team's shit I'll just go and do it all myself right. um, but and he could do it out wide and he's good enough to be out wide against a team like that and probably a lot of the teams in the Premier League as well but um, my, back to my main point what well, I would play a formation that we've not got players for played Milonikov that was the other one that played out of position didn't he Aye. Who, who looks a good player by all accounts um, but like, stop playing players at position or, or change it, change your fucking tactics. Yeah, well, I kept, I kept my scenario on Thursday night in the second half where we were playing 4 4 2 with him at left mid. I, 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 I think he's at his best through the middle and he was banging in the goals. I think it's a no brainer for me. I think he has to, he's a centre forward for me. Hi. I agree with both of you, sir. I don't have anything to, uh, to add to it. So I'll move on to the next question, which is uh, for the hips are here. Not football related, and it's one, uh, believe it or not, I actually know the actual factual answer to. Right? Why don't McDonald's serve the breakfast muffins all day? It's every can. Because would, would, uh, no, I don't. But is it be? Is it because you wouldn't you'd buy that, wouldn't you? Over the other side, would. so, uh, they uh, um, they cook at a different temperature for the burgers, and you only have a limited right? amount of grill space. So you have to choose. Like you, you, you'll set your grills at one temperature in the morning, cook your sausage on it. Gets to half past 10, 11 o'clock now, eh? they, they turn it up for the beef. Uh, that's, it's, that's some in depth knowledge about McDonald's. Like, how'd you get that? Yeah, I spent, spent a bit of time working there in my younger Run days. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that, that's why it is. It there's your answer. Some some of the bigger stores have beer grills and they do a all day breakfast, mm. which would be t- uh, tremendous because the, the muffins are the best things for McDonald's by a country mile. Um, right, Stuart asked, Do we have the whiniest support in Scotland? No, no, no. It's just because you're in it. It's just because you're in it. Look at the Dundee United. We're, we're now, but it's this social media phenomenon that we need to be more angry than everybody else. And it's like Dundee United went daft at Spartans and was it Falkirk fans going daft and they create the wee video so we had to do one. And then because it's us, you're going, oh, I wish, wish I hadn't seen that. Aye. But we're not any more whiny than anybody else when they get an embarrassing result. It's just that it's just that it feels worse because it's us, I think. What, what do you think of that? Right. So that video that went out, right, Two chains of thought, uh, excuse me, two schools of thought went right. There's one paid their money entitled to air the grievances, and actually, when you listen to Joe Newell's interview, he pretty much was like, "I fucking deserved it, right?" Yeah. 
I said, we've, we've, that, that's one else we need to face up to it. The other school of thought is if your bus was late and you pay your money to get a bus, if you gave that level of abuse to the bus driver, you'd probably get fucking lifted. So why is it all right to date a, a well, footballer? It's enough coming to a bit what Ennis was saying at the start. That I know it wasn't abuse about uh, the colour of somebody's skin or the sex or, or gender or, 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 or um, sexuality or anything like that, but it's just abuse in general, isn't it? And it's just almost like football, and is it specifically football, mm-hmm. it's always been a thing. Well, I've paid my money. This is where I come. This is good for my mental health to hear it all, and I'll just shout whatever I want. I get out of focus, spend money, but they chose to spend that money um, to, to go, and they knew that that was a possible outcome of spending that money. So you kind of then go, I fucking spent all that money, like, give me all back. You're like, well, you chose to come here. I'm like, we, we never guaranteed you. A 6 0. 5 0 win. <laughs> like, it was, that's, that's how the game works, and you know that because you're a fan. But I, and I get they're angry. Like, I get they're angry. I just think, um, I don't know, it's, I, I prefer to be angry in a, a more constructive manner, I think. <laughs> Constructively angry. <laughs> 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 uh, I I thought uh, when I first seen it, I was like, "What he's doing?" I I would never boo the hips, to be honest with you. I would just never do it. I get I'd, I'd, I'd shout plenty at <laughs> the football. Don't get me wrong, but I just the manner in which they were shouting just I think it was disrespectful towards the players. Now it's easy for me to see who was watching it in the house on the laptop and that I wasn't over there. I think about a dehydration after the probably sixteen pints that were consumed before had a part to play as well. Well, that's right. Alcohol would have been made it inflated the the sort of. Uh, but it's anger. not. But it's not helping anyone. And as I said at the start of the recording, we're a paranoid group of fans for good reason. We've had some traumatic experiences in the past. Don't get me wrong. But it's the start of the season. We're in a pre-season. You know, if if it was a friendly, for example, we wouldn't be shouting about it. It's just it's a bad result. I. But all teams have bad results. It's our first game of the season, and I, if we're if we're p- consistently doing it, I get it. But I think that was a, that was an over top reaction for me. Uh, right, on on the same topic, Charlie McGrew thinks she made that up. Right, Jake Gapper. He said, uh, "Should fans that scream abuse at players for not winning all the time just go and support Celtic or Man City?" I get the feeling that they uh, that they and their families' lives might become less stressful altogether, happier if they did this. <laughs> Aye, it's not. Uh, but the Celtic, that's the thing though. The Celtic fans go daft when they, they lose a the game as well. It just doesn't happen as often. Um, and, and I get it though, but see, see that's right. There's, so I, I'm, as much as I'm saying, I wouldn't have done it in that way, but uh, I don't know like what other way is there, I suppose, to let your, your anger be known, like write a letter or something. But the the actual, to, to say, ah, it's all right, we'll beat them next week. Does that then fall into the accepting mediocrity? Exactly. Because then if you don't, because we've said before, we need to be angry or after a derby loss, we spoke about it on here. We need to be angry. We need to show that this isn't acceptable. Right? So by going, oh, sorry, it's a half time, two legs, we'll be there next week. Aye. Right? That's that's saying to them, don't worry about it, just be the next week, we'll forget about how shite and embarrassing that was. Mm-hmm. So there's two sides to it. It's just, I don't know how you go about it. It's, it's a really good thing because you look at the like the ultras in Italy and stuff like that and you see the footage of like the the they've all going fucking tonto at training. You know, like if the team's lost at the weekend and they mm. come up for training the, the uh, you know on the Monday or the Tuesday and the ultras are all there giving them fucking what for. And you think there there is that bit about setting standards uh, and mm. things like that. I I just I don't for 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 me as an individual, I didn't like to see it. Like, I always like I support these boys like in the, the guys that are going out on the pitch to represent Hibs, they're representing me, that's how I feel. I want them to do a good job, I want them to do well, and I can when they have a shit game like they did on Thursday, they're probably no meant to have a shit game. I would call them, like, I think somebody shouted, like, you're, you're a retard or something, you think, like, but, but yeah. there's a line, isn't there? Like, I, I think you could say, that, okay, that was shite, or, you know, whatever. I just, I, I think some of it was, it was too far for, uh, for me. That said, I think if I'd paid five hundred quid, as you know, or whatever it was that the folk paid, had been on the sauce all day. Your expectations are high going into that game. It's like fucking brilliant. So you, your Euro trip, you've, you've yeah. sort of since the season's finished and you know what's happening. You've been building up to it and building up to it, and then that happens. I could totally understand why you would want to just let that out uh, at yeah. the same time. 
Uh, right, uh, Ernest, let you take this one. Should Levitt be played as a holding mid or should he play further forward? That's from JDP Tactica. I think you're asking the wrong person, to be honest. I've not seen enough of them. Um, I've only seen really highlight reels. Uh, I think he looks, from what I've seen of him, he looks hopefully the, the recreation of what we had in Scott Allen in the team. And from what I can see from his creativity and his, his vision and his passing range. So I think, yes, I, I would play I, I would play him further forwards. Uh, the problem with that is that, you know, that's Campbell's position um, and the goals that he brings to the team, you'd have to probably take him out. I don't like Campbell further back. And then who are you playing? Who are you playing beside Newell? Is it is it going to be Jago? Is it going to be uh, GDH? I don't know. Bank, if you bring him forwards, you're you're almost lacking that bit of quality that I think we've been needing in the middle of the park alongside Newell. I see Newell, Newell as a grinder, as a grafter in that. I think beside him... We need someone like Levitt to, to sort of spring the pass about. So, to be honest with you, I'm going to cop out and say I don't know. I've, I've got is. no idea. Go on. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know what position he played before he came. I, I, like I'd heard there, but, you know, no idea. Um, and it depends on the formation and all that. He seems to be sticking with that 4-3-3, which leads to that. Um, well, is, is, is Campbell, a, he's not really a 10, is he? Because when it's a 4-3-3, because three, three, you've got the two wide guys. So, you've just got three in the middle. I, I, is it really... Like, I don't know. I don't know what the formation we're playing is. And uh, does it really matter? I don't know. As long as he can pass the ball, but it doesn't matter if he's 10 yards further behind Newell or Light or equal with him in the pitch. I don't know. I think that's I think just how, how we get the ball to him. Right? So whether he's mm. further forward or whether he's deeper, it's getting the ball to him. And we didn't do that at all yeah. on Thursday against Groning, Groning Jim. Well, I don't want to struggle with that fucking word. Right? I just do. <laughs> Van Veen's right? team. Aye, mm. right. Um, we didn't get him on the ball enough either. So it's maybe like a tactical thing where players are only thinking, right, because we go wide a lot and we go long and wide a lot, in which case it doesn't really, you could have anybody in Levitt's place if he's no mm-hmm. picking up the ball, he's not really doing anything. Um, the, there was somebody posted the heat map at Dundee United in his best season and he was in that deep position, which seems to suggest that how he plays his best football is most naturally suited to a, a, a deeper position rather than further it's forward. It's going to be Georg rather than Aye. Alan then if you want to yeah. go back to the comparisons. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's a weak conundrum there for um, for Lee Johnson to solve because he's undoubtedly a good player and if you want to get the best out of him you need to get him on the ball and so we need to train the defenders or the other midfielders to be passing it to him really, yeah. and then let him do his, his work because if we're bypassing him you could like mm-hmm. say you could have anybody that doesn't matter if it's Dolly Hayes or Jago or New or Campbell you know take it back if he's not on the ball he's not doing anything um, right, Stephen Bell, what eggs are best? Boiled, scrambled, fried, poached, or omelette? Sounds like a short bangers one caller, huh? As, I, I, like, I mean, I'm a fan of them all, really. Um, I, I do like a poached egg, but it's just that additional bit of time that goes into that um, compared to a, a fried or a, uh, the, the others. I, I, poached, I'm going poached. And that's... I'll go fried just because, as I said, how, as he said, Colin, how easy it is to make a fried egg. Uh, I think poached eggs are nice. Although, see if you get a uh, perfectly made scrambled egg. They're uh, oh, hard to top. Really? Aye. Really? Um, right, also, Leon's asked a question that's probably more suitable to short bangers than uh, long bangers, but I'll ask it anyway. Right? How, uh, what's the best thing to do when you're late for work? Apologise. Hurry up. <laughs> probably. <laughs> <laughs> the worst thing that I, I used to do a bit of training and that, and I fucking hated folk coming late for my training. I also, on top of that, which isn't the question, hated folk going, What time are we finishing the day? Like, oh, five o'clock, mate. Right, I that, that's what to and, and I'm going to drag this out till five now that you've asked. But the, the actual uh, turning up late and apologising, but standing with a coffee and a big roll in your hand. Like, well, you could have been earlier, though. You might have been late still, but you wouldn't have been this late if you had no big roll in your coffee. Yeah, I, I reject the question because I'm never late. I can hate people that are late. Eh? So if you are late, hang your head in shame and win your neck. And uh, no, no, well, listen, nobody's never late, right? Because there are there are you yeah. can go with the, the the best intentions. You can give yourself plenty of time. But, someone who's saying you're no about it. Yeah, try, try me. I'm never late. I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> There's ways to go about it. You tip folk off. I'm going to be late. I'm, I'm going to be late. I can already see that I'm going to be late because of X, Y, and Z. That's how I go about that. Yeah, give them the heads up. Um, I right, like you did rock up with a, a cup of coffee and a bacon. No, I, what prompted Leon's question? Like, I think Ken is 
Being a tradesman, he'll fucking never be on time, will he? No, I guess <laughs> it's, it's like the loosest. We'll be there around about eight o'clock. That's any time for like half eight past eight, eight till, till twelve. <laughs> Uh, right, Ray first I asked how long till we see this Venti guy with an Aberdeen scarf over his head well hopefully that doesn't happen I think the, the papers are reporting that Venti is on his way to Edinburgh today with a view to being announced uh, tomorrow uh, Life HFC asked thoughts on Jago as captain against Blackpool yeah. no I'm not having no. it I'm sorry <laughs> who would you have as captain then bear in mind there was a lot of these that were playing there is it uh, I would have bought, I would have had Martin Boyle as captain on 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 Saturday. He's, he's been there the longest. He's the biggest figure in the team. He's a key player. But he's a joke it, figure, isn't he? Like that's why he was on the bench the other night. He's there for the last rather than uh, the. Well, yeah, exactly. I, I, the captain role. Jago was bizarre to me. Uh, uh, well, I thought he was probably the most experienced. Other than Boyle, probably the most experienced. I, I can't remember who else uh, played that would have been in the team normally. So I thought he seemed like a fairly natural fit for it. I genuinely didn't think it mattered. Like it was a development team that went out. He was one of the senior players. You could have picked names at a hat for it, really. And because of the type of game it was, it really didn't matter. He's not going to be the captain for any of the games when the, the season starts. So was boy, Did Boyle play the whole game? I take it. Nah, for 40, 45 minutes. Yeah. He was never going to sit back. Right, of course, but he was never going to play the whole game. Or I, did, I expected he would play the whole game. Um, 10 months out. So, like, you make him captain, he's, he's not, I don't know if he's a leader or a, or a laugh, and he's not playing the whole game, so you'd have to pick who's, who's the experienced player, and by all accounts, everybody's saying it was the laddies that played, other than these two that we've mentioned, so 50-50 pick, and here's a guy that's got to play the whole game. Uh, all right, Jeff Ashton, uh, hiya, Jeff, said, I fully expect us to win the second leg and progress, but if we don't, is that the end for Lee Johnson? Uh, secondly, if we get the Swiss in the next round, has anyone else pre-booked a jail to stay in? And uh, Jeff has booked, and uh, uh, I hope I'm no breaching confidentiality here, Jeff. He did tweet it, so she's his own name, and you've seen his hotel room. You'll be getting uh, sacked for the podcast. Uh, by the way, I kind of be like that way. So <laughs> well, he's, he's shared it on Twitter, right? So it's no me that's uh, that's done it. I'm just uh, sharing what's already in the public domain. Uh, you, you've booked your hotel. Uh, you're staying at our hotel, Bar- 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 Barabas, the former prison of Lucerne. Um, your cell is ready for occupancy from 3pm check in from 3pm continues 24 hour possible code for door opening from he has got the code there as well Jeff you're not going Amazing. to tweet down mate. I'll, that. I'll not read that out um, but anyway your date of birth is um, <laughs> <laughs> um, right so yeah I, I don't get in touch if you've, if you've booked to stay in the Swiss prison it sounds like an interesting stay but if we don't progress is that Johnson's time up I don't think it will be, but I think it'll, it'll find it really hard. Uh, like the 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 growing, like I don't think from the club's point of view, it will be. But I think going into the first league game, second league game, third, if there's no one or three, then there'll be a growing momentum, and we'll be wanting first international break to to change it, and we'll be in a total fucking state. Of new manager coming in in September or October by the time we get round to it, and them going, nah, don't fancy Venti and. Uh, you had aye that's it good to stay uh, yeah spend all that money start, and we didn't want to start the game yeah and I spoke you what do you think no it, it won't be the end of them uh, look it's a bad it's a, it'd be a bad result it, it'd be a, it'd be an awful result I don't, I don't want to understate that but look, look give, give them give them at least half season we need to give them a chance you know what I mean like uh, uh, to be fair uh, the boys that are on, I'm on the group chat. Will be shouting at their phones, like, and you were wanting them out quite early doors. And I did, to be fair, when we were, we had that terrible period where we got battered off hearts, and the players were they running for them and that. I was like, this is an absolute circus. Like, I want them out. But yeah. I think, uh, I, you know, I hold my hands up and I sort of reflect on that and think, you know, if you look at us, Hearts and Aberdeen, we've all went through a sort of turmoil period in the last year. But I think the strength that we have against those two teams that we've stuck with Johnson and actually given them a chance. And I think we can't have the club becoming a poison chalice. That Whenever you come here, a few bad results and you're out the door. You know, you look at Aberdeen, they've got a potential with Barry Robson. We don't know how well he's going to do. That could have just been a manager's bounce last season. Yeah. Named it is, is Naismith even in charge of Hearts? No one even knows no, that. Not. So No, no, they said I, he's not. They said it's the other guy, Frankie. It's in charge, you said. Well, there you go. So, 
I think there's I think there's strength in that, and I think the the team got a bit of a lift when Nisbet came out to that interview and said, "Look, we can't keep sacking sack managers. We need to get behind Johnson." And I think we need to give him a chance. Okay, if he has a bad result, doesn't he go our way on Thursday night? You know, it'd be different if it's a it's a first five or six games. You know, we're not winning, and it's no looking like it's going anywhere. Fair enough, but it's not going to be the end on on Thursday. No chance. I think it puts the pressure on massively, though, doesn't it? Like, there's already like a group of the fans that are are happy. Can we be happy if we got sacked tomorrow? And we've been given the, the second leg. We'd be happy with. It. Um, I think he then needs to win all his opening games. Almost like he can't afford the bad mm-hmm. result until you play probably Rangers or Celtic. Uh, anything else will will we'll just kind of pile on the uh, the pressure. Mm-hmm. Um, Elston Luna asks, what did uh, Lee Johnson's post match actions and interview change in terms of your views about him? I was surprised that he said, because I don't know if he did say this, because I couldn't see him saying it, but the fans that were there said he said, Cam Down, it's only pre-season. Mm-hmm. Now, I get the Cam Down part, but I didn't get the it's only pre-season part, because the whole point of last season was to have that game, Aye. and that is the pre-season. It's a competitive game. So, so I disagree that with that if he said, Cam Down, it's only pre-season. As I say, I could have stopped at the Cam the fuck Down, would have been maybe what I would have Said although that would have been inflammatory. I don't know what he could have said in that that way. Because uh, if he'd ignored them, I mean, somebody was even shouting in that. Go back to this video. Somebody was shouting in that video. Who the fuck are you clapping? Because <laughs> they were clapping them coming off, right? So, but if they, if they ignored them, then they would have been complaining that they never even acknowledged them. So I'm not sure what what reaction he do could have think, made. Do you think he needed his Pedro Casina standing in a hedge? Uh, I, I'm uh, not sure what he could have done. See, I think like Newell apologising for it. I think that would have went a wee bit away for it. The other yeah. thing for uh, that I didn't like with, with is his first thing was immediately to shift the blame onto the players. I know, but he does that. It's, I, it's I know. A, and I, I, just, I just thought, I can hell, right, you're the manager. The manager's supposed to take the blame. You know, the, that's where the buck stops. But he said... Uh, Plus of the responsibility, he has accountability, doesn't that's he? That's it. That's it. And, and and he says, you know, they had all the they had all the information we gave them. I, I don't know what happened. Yeah. Like fucking yeah. wash his hands out. And, yeah. and then he later went on to sort of acknowledge some things that he might have done differently, which you know, like maybe getting there a day earlier. Um, yeah. But it was very much like that's not what I wanted them to do. It's not my fault. It was was how how I got. And yeah. I, I think if you're a player, that's not great. And I think I'm not get not, not to get too linked in about it, Colin. Uh, mm-hmm. I think if you're looking for strong leadership, you need somebody to come out and say, "I got that wrong." Like, I either I never communicated what I needed the players to do well enough, or I didn't motivate them well enough, or I didn't set the uh, yeah. the, the bar of what we needed high enough uh, for the players to know what was expected. So that's on me. Take it on the chin, and then we'll go and win on Thursday. That that's what I would have expected to see from. I was disappointed with his his interview. Mm-hmm. What were you honest? Uh, I I don't listen to him after we get beat because he does my head in, to be honest with you. Um, but you it's, it's, I, it's I just it's just know. it's a classic though because I, I used to say about Jack Ross like see when we were winning he he was so dude and methodical and see when you're winning you're listening to him going oh no this, this guy's brilliant and we're getting beat and you're like I can't he stand him man <laughs> but no I, I I don't I didn't listen to him I heard what he said obviously to to play devil's advocate I mean I think the play I think it was the players you know I I, I go back to it they were jogging it was played mm-hmm. at half pace. What more could have Lee Johnson really said to those players to get them to run faster and actually care about well, the game? If you listened in lockdown, if you listened to the, the managers in lockdown when you had clearer, if you take Yogi, he was shouting at them to run faster or kick it harder <laughs> or win it or seconds second, and stuff like second that. Ball. So, so all these kind of things, that's the kind of stuff you're supposed to shout. I guess so. I mean, I, I, think, um, but I think it's important that, you know, I think we do, we do put a lot of blame on managers a lot of time, and sometimes it is the players that let them down. If you look at that Aberdeen side that came third, they were they running for Jim Goodwin. Do you know what I mean? And uh, you know, sometimes the players just need to stand up and take responsibility as well. I think that was one of those days, to be fair. Uh, do you know what? I think maybe you see that, uh, like an example of that is, like you say, Colin, when you and try to take the whole team on himself. Mm-hmm. Melkerson did it a couple of times where he was like, got three players in them and he's trying to beat them all. And you go, yeah. see if you're playing Celtic or you're playing Hearts or Aberdeen. That ball's moved on quickly. I genuinely think you, that's complacency. I, and it's like, we're better than them, they're shite. Right? You know, this has been the chat, we'll beat them easy. You know, it's I, like, and it's like, well, I'll, I'll get the glory here. I want, to, I, I want to get in the team. Me and you, I'm going to be starting anyway, but 
which, which might not help either because he knows that. But Melkerson's thinking, well, if I get a couple of goals here, I'm in my shout. Right. Yeah, he's, and the, he's well at the picture, you know, but that might the, have brought him in it. The, the complacency and the attitude towards the game, that comes from the manager. That resonates from yeah. the play, the coaches that are telling you what to do. And they, that, that was, yeah, as you said, Matty, that was the vibe going into it and that, that translated on the pitch. So I Johnson could have done a lot better, um, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, right, Colin, you kind of touched on this earlier on. Um, Lex Lofar said the formation is killing us. Three up top is fine if you have the players available. We didn't on mm-hmm. Thursday. It was crying out for a 4 4 2 or a 4 1 3 2 formation. One up front against that lot is unforgivable and continually playing guys out of position will be the death of LJ Easter Road. I could, no, I totally agree. I hadn't seen that, Lex, but no, I agree. Um, Mixu1999 says, do you automatically get the right to act like a spoiled, angry man-child because Hibs lose a single first-leg game as you travelled abroad for the game? Um, so I think we probably covered that one uh, as well. It's a really tricky one, that, eh? Like, I, I kind of kind of... We, we have covered it. Stay Switzerland on it. I, I, I well, we almost have stayed Switzerland on it. I can see both sides, yeah. But I, I wouldn't... I, I don't like to see it, but I, under, I kind of can understand. But then I don't see bringing the money in yet. It should be a... Like, like the money's your choice. The, the disappointment is the result. We were all angry whether we were there or not. Yeah. And, and I, I shouted fuck off at the telly. Do you know, like, I, and I would have shouted fuck off at the game. Probably at, <laughs> at, at final whistle, we'd have, been, we'd have went off, we'd have went off, fuck off. And then that would have been it. It would have been done. I didn't think I would have went to front up with the players and sh- constantly just sh- I think that I, that, that's where I think the line is eh? is like do, do you really need to to be yelling at the players I always think that if I've, see if I've done shit at my work I, imagine like you went out to your customers and they were just like you're a fucking arsehole you're a fucking dickhead give me my money but you've gone fuck this you know, you, can you come and say I sorry I didn't mean to do that like I'll I can give you a mm-hmm. refund or whatever and you'd do it in a civil manner but imagine going to Tesco because they got the fucking shopping wrong and or can you, like, McDonald's get your order wrong because so you go back in, you chuck the, the fucking food at them and... The fuck well, do they that? They do. You know what? It's kind of become more acceptable now, eh? They do it. Aye. It's Joe, it would have been a, a just as powerful message and more respectful as if none of them were there at the end. If they just left it full time and there was Didn't no one there... clap them off? No yeah. one there to clap them off. They've just travelled away to Andorra and every single one of those fans have just left the stadium because they're no clapping that off because they're no running for the shirt. That would have been a respectful... Decent yeah. way of doing it, but no, they were rattling the case. Hard to organise that, though. Uh, it's Aye, kind of, it's you hard to organise it. Yeah. Right. Was it the Spanish table? The, the white hankies and that, eh? Like, they, <laughs> at the games, they yeah. the white hankies out and yeah. show it that way. It's just like a sort of a, a, a proper show of disdain, isn't it? Like, fuck you. Mm. Can't, I'm not even going to shout at you. Just get a white hanky and you can all see what I think of you. Um, imagine all the Hibs fans rocking up with hankies in the top pocket. <laughs> no, right. uh, Saturday, <laughs> like, <laughs> boys are. Straight for their afternoon tea call. <laughs> I had a wee blazer on yesterday for the other. <laughs> um, I think we covered this one as very Thoughts on Lee Johnson's uh, post-match comments essentially telling fans to calm down. It uh, came off very brash, in my opinion. The only thing I would say with that is, they, so, since to anybody to calm down, see when somebody's annoyed and you tell them to calm down, it never fucking works. Like I, and, <laughs> and, and I've done it, and being the person saying, oh, calm down, hundreds of times, mm. never learn, it doesn't work. Saying it to like a, a like a bear mob, if you like, isn't it going to work? But it's interesting that the words "calm down" were more inflammatory to some than "fuck off, you retards." <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, like it's the, it's the dynamics wrong, uh, uh, wrong there. I think, um, but I probably wasn't the wisest thing. There was the like you say, called the preseason uh, element to that I, I comment. That's true because I didn't see that in the video. So uh, I mean, I don't know if he said that separately or if it was in that video or whatever. So, because that's outrageous to say that because, as I say, the whole point of 36 games or whatever it is we play in a season is for that game or for and then hopefully the ones after it. So you yeah. can't say it's only pre-season. It's not. That's why we played fucking oil last season. Aye, it's an important game. Uh, Fraser Ross said, uh, we'd have played Mackay over Melkerson all day long. Uh, keeper needs dropped and or punted. Uh, JDH changes like the wind. Uh, Stevenson's just... Uh, just know, should always st- uh, start on the bench. We'd have played Hanlon left back with Harbottle and Rocky centre. Uh, for me, Miller must be first choice right back. Uh, so quite a lot to unpick there, right? Mackay over Melkerson. Interestingly, I, I, interestingly, I actually said I think Mackay will play in Boyle's position just to give him a chance because we've not seen him for ages. He had a good season last season. Um, 
I, you know, I, I would have given him a chance to be fair. Yeah, I, don't, I, I hope he's not a starter. I, I'd hope we've got someone else in by then, but yeah, I would have given him a chance. I, I uh, forgot about McKay um, the other day when the team came out because I said in one of the chats, when I said, Who'd you, you play instead? Like, and it was McKay. I thought, Why? But then somebody was, I was reading, I think it was Hibs.net this morning, and somebody was saying he, he, he wasn't great yesterday either. So I'm not sure that maybe he's not. I don't know if he's the option. But then Play somebody in the position rather than somebody out of position, eh? Yeah. Well, yeah, so I was going to say, well, it's, we go back to, we need a player. We need a white man. <laughs> you know, if we're going to play that position, we need options, surely. Yeah, yeah. The issue is Stevenson. I think uh, Stevenson has struggled pre-season. Like, in all the games that I've seen him, he's no looked like he did last season. I know putting this still as in his uh, age or anything like that, but I think the quicker will beat us fit and in the team, the better. Or you maybe need to look at McIntyre to come in because I just think Stevenson just looks like a wee bit off form. Yeah, that that could be though. It could be the age and the recovery time for pre-season. Maybe the, maybe he's not being fully managed. Maybe giving it, maybe I'm giving him an excuse because it was only three months ago we were saying he was still. Oh, aye. That's so obviously what first choice pick. Yeah. So maybe pre-season's taking the toll on him, and once he gets into a normal. Routine on a Saturday, Wednesday, and recovery days, and all that shit. Um, then he'll, he'll be all right again. But he was poor the other night. Like I thought he was well off it. And I, and I joked about. Uh, nobody's mentioned the altitude yet. I joked. I was joking in the group chat when I said a wee at altitude because they kept kicking the ball too hard, like they were kicking it out of the park and fucking miles in front of folk. No realizing we were at altitude, but um because th- like the ball goes the ball for travel further in altitude eh? yeah like, and but then why, why is it not being adapted to like they, they must do it once and go fuck kick it oh no kick it's hard next time and we kept doing it and, he, and stevenson was quite a culprit for it i thought oh, mate. Uh, there's a few times just passing the ball straight at the, at the mm. park um i think it was windy as well no, that kind of, we were used to playing in the wind in, in mm. scotland but joe new commented that saying like anything you played the ball high the wind caught it and was was making mm. it run out of play uh, sorry, I'm sorry, but I hate that excuse. Like, I I, I played a boys' club, and as as you said, Colin, you adapt it pretty quickly. You you adjust your game to like Stevenson experience player. He's been playing for about twenty years. And he wasn't. It's not like he flighted the ball out of play and thought, all right, I better play on the deck. He flighted it out of play about six times. I know, it was a lot. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but I thought for an experienced player, should should he be that bad? Uh, Jack said, uh, team for next season as things stand, Bolacott, Miller, uh, Harbottle or Fish, Hanlon, Harbottle or Fish, uh, and Obita, uh, Boyle, Newell, Levitt, Mackay, Yuan and Vente. Uh, back to basics, a 4-4-2, Newell sitting and Levitt going forward, Boyle, Mackay, wingers pushing forward, cutting in as much as possible. That team looks all right, I think. I've not, heard, not seen Harbottle, no idea. Um, Matteo has just been in Rocky all the way. Like, he's, he's out of the picture. Ah, uh, he's... Uh, uh. He is... Um, Who was that from Avente? Was it Yuan? Ah, uh, Yuan Avente. I quite like Rocky. Honestly, I so uh, I've had an interesting conversation on uh, Hibs.net, right? So if you take uh, and somebody went to the trouble of breaking down Rocky's uh, stats with different players in front of him, right? So obviously, like if you just look at a, a straightforward, do we win more when he plays or if we lose when he plays? It's no. It's like it's, it might give you an idea, but it doesn't really tell you anything because there's so many other variables. Okay, who were the games against? Who were the other players that featured in those uh, those games? Who was the manager? Okay, what formation we were playing? All these things come into it, right? So it doesn't really tell you that much. Uh, but they'd broken down uh, Rocky with this partner, Rocky with that partner, when that player's played with somebody else and all the rest of it. They'd gone to quite some trouble uh, to make the point. Um, you know, if you've got the time to do that, great. Um, but it did show Rocky was a bit of weakness in, in the team. Uh, I like him. I think he had a, a good season last season. I think we've bought in players to replace him, though. That would be my view. I prefer him over Hamlin. I really do. Yeah, um, I, I, I'd have Hamlin every day over On the left hand side, though. I, I didn't even think it's close there. I, I would have Hamlin. I'd say I'd, I'm, not, I'm not a Hamlin fan. I'm not, I thought he was so, he had a solid six months with Fish there. But I think when. when when Hanlon needs to be relied upon as the sturdy centre back, i.e., if he's got a more erratic centre back next to him, like Porches or Rocky, who likes to take the ball forward and and take players on and play passes, he's not reliable. I, I don't. I'm not a Hanlon fan whatsoever. I'm not. 
Yeah, do's. Um, right, we're going to rattle through the next one because we're kind of uh, are treading into feature length film territory here for the length of this <laughs> podcast. So um, we'll rattle through the next few and then we will uh, wrap up if we call and I go to record extra time. Uh, so, our John Curvin is bit said, How are you to describe the mindset of a supporter who purchased a season ticket the day after the season ending defeat to enter Escalades? That's a commitment, isn't it? It's a commitment, aye. It's quite incredible, actually. Because you've always got to renew. Like if you're always got to renew, then it doesn't really matter when you do it, I suppose. But it's quite, uh, it's almost a statement. It's like deliberate. It's either commitment or you need committed. Uh, mm-hmm. Like one of the Bit two. Both. Um, JPJ White said, uh, was abusing the players when they came off the pitch the actions of true fans or a petulant overreaction to disappointment? I think we've covered that in, in a fair bit of depth this episode. Uh, Craig McFarlane said, I don't understand why a lot of the youth players aren't getting a chance. We lost Laidlaw to Brentford a few days ago, which is a step up from Hibs. That should tell us something. And I Brentford, B. Brentford B. Brentford B. Right. Yeah. And I said, any yeah. views on, on the youth players? Should we be playing them more? Massively, yeah. I, th- I think they need to get a chance. I think Laidlaw is a massive missed opportunity. When you look at, you know, last season, when in the sort of, you know, in the scenario where you lose like three of your best strikers, i.e. Boyle, Nisbet and uh, Big Mick, uh, the big Ukrainian, the, the the thought that a youngster doesn't then come in is is bizarre to me, to then bring McCurdy in for 400 grand, who is uh, absolutely useless. I I, th- I just think that's a massive letdown. It's a poor reflection of the, of the club and, and our roots and the good teams that I certainly have seen as a 27-year-old. It's all come from those youth players. And if you look at the success we've had, it's been on the back of, Josh Stoig, Ryan Porches, the, the money they were getting for these players. So I think it's an insult and uh, the boys in my group chat will be pissing themselves because I'm always going all about McIntyre. Like, give the lad a chance. You know what I mean? Like, get, if, if, they, if this boy, uh, McAllister as well, who played a, a great ball yesterday apparently, if he's firing and Levitt isn't ready, give him a chance. I don't know. I, I think, yeah, I'd, I'd massively agree with it. Uh, okay, guys. Yes, Jez. Uh, it's buzzing for the second half. Still fairly confident on a bigger pitch that they'll struggle. I think if we score early, they will collapse. It's a terrible result, though, uh, from Thursday. Do you have any doubts that we're going to go through on Thursday? No, I don't think so. I think we're through. Go on. Uh, just, just a niggle at the back. Like, you know, based on the defence of the turn up, because they, they, they've shown they're, they're capable of turning up like they did. Like, I think we were. Scottish football fans, British football fans are probably a bit dismissive, or certainly Scottish fans are dismissive of other teams we've not heard of. And we get caught out every year. I see we no have like Scottish teams get caught out every year with complacency and no being ready and, 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 and embarrassed. And that's why I call it the race to humiliation, uh, the European race. And and we're sitting at half time in a in in pole position to be humiliated. So don't expect it, but I, I wouldn't be surprised. Right, I tell you what we'll do, we've still got quite a lot of talking points to go, Colin, so I think we'll take these ones into extra time along with our uh, predictions. you got a pen and paper ready for them? Yeah, I'll get one. Right. Uh, and what we'll do is so just, we'll just predict a score for Thursday and we will uh, we will wrap up. So, Ennis, how, how are you? What, what score line do you reckon it'll be on Thursday night? I think it'll be 3-0 Hubs on Thursday. I'm, I'm confident. I think the boys will get a reaction and I think the, the Johnson doubters will be silenced at least for a, for a week or two. And uh, give, give us the... Give us the website for the White Ribbon campaign before you, you Yeah, go. so if you're going to do anything today, as I said, please, it'll take 30 seconds of your time on your phone. Go into whiteribbonscotland.org.uk and make a pledge never to condone, commit, or stay silent about violence against women, and you'll be making a massive contribution uh, to starting a huge uh, change in culture uh, in the safety towards everyone in our society. Thank you. And Colin, your, your score prediction for Thursday? Any one. Nice one. All right, I'm going to go for a... Uh, Five nine. Oops. <laughs> I, 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 we'll, get, we'll come out flying. We'll get an early goal and then the, the, the floodgates will open. The, the other thing I noticed about them is they were fucking gassing by like, the last 10 minutes. They looked like mm. they were running through Chico. Um, and I think on the big pitch, Easter Road, if we get the ball moving, just get them chasing it and then take, take, you use the fitness, etc., to take them apart. Right, anyway, Ennis, thanks very much for uh, for joining us. Uh, Colin, Thanks, thanks for your time as always. Uh, we'll be back with extra time on uh, Wednesday. We'll record that just now. Um, so you can subscribe by going to our Twitter and uh, clicking on our bio if you've not checked out our Matty Jack episode for last week. I would thoroughly recommend it. Loads of good feedback on that as well. Absolute legend. Um, right, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Cheers.
county line I pledged upon Oh, well, they trailed me down when I broke free I drank all the whiskey in Tennessee I don't 